So, uh, my name is Jan de Leeuw, um, and I'd like to give a presentation today about a project which uh, we did, where we looked into approaches to assess the risk of developing groundwater in Sub-Saharan Africa. This project, which was funded uh, <coughs> uh, by NORC and DFID, and the Upgrow project, uh, fits in a broader program at ECRAF, which aims to develop approaches to improve investment risk assessment and risk management in the developing world. So it's part of a broader initiative at ECRAF. And the reason why we do this is that we are aware that investment risk in Sub-Saharan Africa are still significantly higher than in most parts of the developing developed world. Uh, so there's an issue to help our development partners to uh, um, to develop these approaches and uh, <clears throat> use them. Our project, if you can go to slide number two. Um, you actually have control of your own PowerPoint, so you can move between the slides with the arrows just above. Um, if you can see the arrows left and right above the slide, you can actually move yourself. Oh. I'm Let not quite see. sure what happened there. Are you still there, Jan? No, I don't see it. So. Um, Martin, perhaps you could give me back presenter rights and I'll move Jan's slides. That would oh, yeah. make it a little bit easier, I think, for him. Yeah. Oh, you've got it. Wonderful. Okay, carry on. So our project looked into the risk around a plan to develop uh, groundwater resources to supply the city of Wajir in northern Kenya uh, with clean water. And you see uh, Wajir town here, uh, the red dot. Um, what here is on top of a very shallow uh, groundwater uh, <coughs> body, uh, which is highly contaminated because of livestock excrements and human excrements are contaminating this. The city is rapidly growing also, it's having 300,000 people and is expected to grow to a million in the next 10 years or something, so there's really a water scarcity there. And the plan is now to uh, look into um, uh, getting a pipeline to bring water from the Merti Aquifer, which is 100 kilometers to the south, um, to support the uh, city of Wajir and supply it with water. The Merti Aquifer, there's a smaller city, uh, it's called Hadeswein, uh, and the people uh, in that area, they have uh, um, mixed feelings about this initiative. Um, so we were very happy <coughs> Uh, when the project, the NERC Upgrow project started uh, to uh, start working with the partners from Habeswein, from Wajir, and other partners who are involved in developing this project. So the Habeswein Wajir pipeline project <coughs> um, is a project which was uh, developed by the government of Kenya, uh, who started the planning process. Um, but in Kenya, we have recently a process of devolution, which brings the power uh, from the national level to the level of the county, so that's the county of Wajir. Um, and so far, this project has been going on, the, uh, the one which was led by the government of Kenya. Stakeholder involvement has been extremely poor. So there's, uh, because stakeholders are hearing about the project but not getting the fine details, there's growing uh, concern and opposition to the plans among stakeholders, especially in Habeswein. Now, one specific aspect of the project is that the, the Dutch development uh, donor organization, Oreo, is ready to invest up to 38 million euros, one third as a, as a gift and two thirds as a soft loan. Um, but they have put a quish, uh, condition that the project requires first several feasibility studies. Um, thus far, only the hydrological feasibility study and the technical uh, feasibility study has been uh, done. Uh, what has not been done is to look at social impacts. Um, what also has not been done is to look at the financial uh, feasibility of this whole project. Um, and many more risks should be considered, um, <clears throat> but at the moment uh, we think that there's no initiative there, and we also think that adequate planning methods are missing. Oh, I will tell you something more about the Merti Aquifer, but very briefly. 
Um, the Magic Aquifer is located in the uh, Hamza Rift, the blue uh, <coughs> rift which you see uh, through this figure here, uh, which runs from South Sudan across Mount Marsha Beach, which is a volcano, and down to that, then down to uh, Habeswein and further into Somalia. Um, the Oashu Nero River, which is coming from Mount Kenya and uh, the Abadares, is adding additional surface water, which is recharging the aquifer, uh, which is also sought to get a, a large part of the re recharge uh, up in the, uh, the Rift Valley near, near Mashavit. <laughs> Our project has been looking um, <clears throat> at one part of the research into the hydrogeology uh, of the Merti Aquifer and the risks which are there from a hydrological perspective. The water in this rift valley is uh, known to overlie uh, saline water. And uh, we've been looking into the risk of developing a borehole field near Habeswein, and particularly what is the risk of aquifer depletion uh, what are the risks of boreholes running dry and what are the risks of boreholes turning saline, upconing of saline water? Well, we consider that the risk of aquifer depletion uh, in the next 30 or 40 years is not very uh, realistic because it's a, risk, a rich aquifer. Um, there's a much greater risk of boreholes running dry and boreholes turning saline and our hydrogeologists have been doing um, modeling of this uh, to assess these risks. But the main uh, part I want to communicate uh, with you and share with you today is not so much on the hydrogeology, but uh, the, the decisions on investment and the related uh, risk uh, and, and for investment. Um, so development um, decisions normally affect many, many stakeholders. And um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly also with groundwater resources in Africa, data is often extremely scarce. It is not only um, hydrological data which are missing, but there's a lot of other data which are hard to come by. Another, possibility, another thing to consider is if we want to look at risk, there are many possible outcomes, and not of them are uh, satisfactory um, <clears throat> to the uh, stakeholders. Now, most scientific approaches are ill-equipped for such uh, situations. Um, and there's business analysis methods that are much better suited. Uh, and one of these we are working with is called Applied Information Economics, offers guidelines for analysis to assess the risk of investment. So let me introduce you to the decision uh, modeling process. Um, there's, uh, we started with participatory modeling, um, where we had brought a large number of stakeholders uh, together and we discussed with them the impact pathways, the positive sides, the benefits, but also the negative sides, the costs which are there, and the risks which are related to the uh, project. Based on that, we sat down with a number of more technical people. We refined the model and we fed that back to the participatory group uh, to see whether we did the right thing. Um, we identified a number of uncertainties <clears throat> and then we trained a group of stakeholders who are well aware of uh, hydrology, but also of groundwater management and uh, development of um, water supply systems in training uh, to calibrate the uh, model. Basically, we, we trained them to estimate uh, variables where they were uncertain. So instead of asking them to give an average value, we asked them, you're uncertain. So try to estimate the range, the 90% interval, uh, where you feel comfortable that the true value would lie in between. <laughs> Um, and then we were running these models with the stakeholder estimates, and we did a random per, uh, Monte Carlo permutation analysis, repeating the model 10,000 times and drawing uh, different parameter values at random every time we ran the model. Um, and basically, if you do that as an outcome, you get uh, a distrib frequency distribution of your net present value, the gains or the losses that the investment will make. Uh, but you also have the possibility to identify variables 
which have a high value from an uh, uh, information perspective and which are interesting to look at into more detail. <clears throat> so based on that, um, you, we, one could take more measurements uh, if we, uh, somebody says, well, these variables are variables which are contributing a lot to the uncertainty in the model, uh, more measurements could reduce that uncertainty and just reduce the uncertainty in the overall model. So we did further analysis, the stochastic hydrological modeling. I reported you briefly, but that's not what I want to share with you. And also we did an extensive socioeconomic surveys and had repetitive meetings with the stakeholder group to discuss where we were. <clears throat> so the decision modeling process, it started with a one day inception and discussion workshop with around 30 stakeholders in science, practice and policy. Then a two day modeling workshop with eight experts. Um, we developed the model co uh, code, and that's my uh, co presenter, Eik Ludeling. Uh, he's the programmer, so he did the uh, uh, coding of the model. Um, <coughs> and then we were seeking feedback uh, from our stakeholders on the model structure and the estimates of the uncertain variables. We ran the model. And after that, we organized a one day workshop to present the results to our stakeholders and discuss it with them. Um, a one day event in the field to present and discuss the results. And meanwhile, we have had another day uh, with stakeholders, a large group, particularly from Harbors Rhein, where the water will be abstracted, um, who are concerned and like to know more about the approach and what it could in what way it could help them to reduce their uncertainties. So here you see the model. Um, and basically you see in um, uh, yellow, well, you see yellow colors, you see that there's a number of benefits of uh, the project. Uh, benefits to the people from Magir, benefits to the people from Harbors Wine, for communities around the pipeline, uh, benefits for the uh, water company. Um, but there's also uh, costs um, to uh, these different uh, stakeholder groups. So we, <clears throat> we uh, modeled for these different stakeholder groups, what are their costs and what are the benefits. Uh, then we ran the random um, Monte Carlo uh, simulation model uh, and we calculated the frequency distribution of the net present value uh, <coughs> for all these different uh, stakeholders. So what you see over here is a graph which is showing the uh, uh, frequency distribution of net present value for these different stakeholders. Uh, you will see that the donor uh, will have uh, a frequency distribution. They are certain to make a loss on this project, but that is anticipated. They're just investing in it, so they, they, they won't mind. But you see also that the community in Wajir, um, it is more likely that they will have a negative uh, outcome of the project than a positive outcome of the project. A surprising thing is that our simulations reveal that the people from Wajir are likely to get uh, uh, a high chance of a positive outcome. The risk that they run into the negatives are very limited. Um, and similar for the pipeline communities. The reason is that they don't have to invest in a lot of the infrastructure which the people in Wajir have to invest in. One of the worrying things of our model is that the water company, uh, which is supposed to take over the project after it has started, is having a severe risk of negative outcomes. And if you believe in the, in the public private partnership model where a water company makes the system uh, work, uh, then having a, such a frequency distribution for this private partner is worrying. So uh, we shared this with our stakeholders who also felt alerted about it. We also did for downstream and upstream communities uh, simulation that uh, while well, the downstream communities might be affected, but uh, slightly negatively, the upstream communities, it's more neutral and the total project has a severe risk for negative outcomes. One of the interesting thing of this modeling is that you can calculate the value of every single variable, um, the information value. 
and uh, give it a, a variable importance score. Um, and a variable importance score above 0 0.8 indicates variables which are considered to have a significant effect on the uncertainty of the outcome of the total model. Um, and these are variables which are interesting to look at um, if you want to reduce the uh, uncertainty around the outcome of the total model. So you will see that we have a value of a surviving instance, proof project design, um, the additional number of uh, children uh, surviving, the risk of political interference, a number of other variables uh, are important. Um, and uh, we think that uh, just looking in more detail in a number of these variables, doing proper research to see can we narrow down the uncertainties around these variables might help just to reduce the uncertainty around the overall uh, investments. Um, you will see that we have a number of variables here which have to do with uh, social and political, political tensions. If you take out these variables, you will find that a number of variables which are more hydrological, like the price of water um, and the number of people buying the water, uh, come up higher in this listing. And these are variables which we think uh, need to be looked at seriously, particularly from the perspective of the water company also. I'm sorry about this. There's a white dot uh, on my screen. I think you must have the same, so you can't see what is displayed here. Um, but uh, we can design the project search. Uh, uh, there's a number of design variables that we think we need to look into, reduce the, the chance of poor project design, guards against salinity uh, intrusion, and ensure ad adequate benefit sharing for, between the people upstream and downstream. So our outcomes and conclusions is that the stakeholder involvement <coughs> um, and research focus on a, a concrete decision and short interest in our study results. Actually, we've had requests to come back to the uh, uh, Wajia community, the senator and the uh, members of pol uh, parliament uh, from the um, county but also the local community and community-based organizations uh, come to us with requests to provide more information and help to assist them to get a better insight into uh, the risk around this investment. Um, we think it was very useful to do a structured analysis of these decisions, um, which were considering the impact pathway of investing in freshwater development based on a, a groundwater body, um, and that it enhances stakeholder understanding of the decision. Um, as an example, there was the chairman of the Northern Water uh, Watershed Board uh, who said at some time, I came as a firm believer in this project. I am now aware of that there is significant risk, and I think that we need to consider these risks uh, much more seriously before just making a decision. Um, so several stakeholders changed their opinions on the interventions. <clears throat> um, our analysis also revealed what are the critical risks that would likely to have remained unnoticed and uh, um, which are risks which uh, we think need to uh, receive more attention and need to be measured with more accuracy to see whether we can just start a project with a lower risk profile. So we think that decision analysis methods have a great potential for aiding decisions on groundwater use and other complex issues. Uh, <clears throat> Particularly in, if you consider that um, you have to take these decisions with imperfect information and just using uh, this approach where you start to use the opinion of experts on the range of uncertainties is very helpful to model that. I thank you for your attention.